Yeah, I was thinking, so why would somebody from a small town in Ontario, from a very conservative area of Ontario, be interested in the other? Because generally, they're not. <laughs> and I was thinking, if you think back to my father, my parents, um, my dad, he was brought up in England from a declining manufacturing family. One of those families that make their money really quick in the end of the 19th century, and then they lose it very quick. So his family was into quarrying around the Sheffield area in England. And um, so his brother and his sister were brought up in private school. By the time he came to go to school, or advanced school, the money had run out, the estate had to be sold off, and there was just a house left. So he had to go get a trade. He couldn't go to, you know, top private school in that area. So he decided he was going to do journalism, or not journalism so much as printing. So he learned uh, the printing trade, linotype operating, typesetting, how to work the machines. He had a very mechanical mind. His, um, from a story he told me, he said that his, uh, believe it was his father had invented this the frictionless ball bearing which is a huge invention it means you no longer had to lubricate ball bearings in engines if, if these were naturally frictionless but he worked for a company of course and they got the patent he didn't get anything for it and my brother's an engineer one of my brothers is an engineer um, so <clears throat> he had a kind of a mechanical bent but he also had a fairly good education up until that time. So we're talking just before the war here. And um, believe it or not, he also had a pilot's license, which he'd got like coming up out of the affluence. And he'd raced motorcycles in England. <coughs> so he was working for a newspaper in Blackpool. And uh, that's where he met my mother. And Lord Thompson commandeered him and a crew of printers or journalists to go to South Africa and set up a, a newspaper in Johannesburg. And it was going to be anti-apartheid. Now, this is like 1937, right around there. Well, an anti-apartheid newspaper in 1937 in Johannesburg. So they went out there and they tried to set up this newspaper, but of course they couldn't get advertising. Yeah, advertisers are all white, and everybody else is black. So, <clears throat> so they had to pack up <clears throat> and uh, and go home. So he was telling me that while he was in South Africa, he really hated apartheid. He hated the separation of the, the uh, African from the Afrikaners and the British. So what he used to do is he used to sneak into football games with the. Where they were supposed to sit instead of sitting with the, the whites and go into washrooms where he wasn't supposed to go and getting into trouble all the time, doing stuff like that. So there was that aspect, right, <clears throat> of his background. And so they had to go back to England, and it was 1939 when they headed back. And they got onto a German freighter to head back to England. And while they were on the freighter, war broke out. And the captain of the freighter had to make a decision whether to intern them as a prisoners of war or set them loose. And he hated Hitler. So he let them off in Gibraltar. So my dad escaped out of Gibraltar into Spain, got arrested for being illegal, escaped from jail, made his way down to the coast, got on a fishing boat and sailed back to England. Tried to enlist in the RAF but he'd contracted malaria while he was in Africa, so they wouldn't allow him to fly. So they said he would have to work with his brother who had a farm in Cheshire. The two of them would farm throughout the war providing food and stuff like that. The trouble was he and his brother didn't get along very well. So it lasted for 
a little while, maybe a year or so. Then they split up, and my dad bought a farm in Yorkshire, uh, Huddersfield, Halifax area, which isn't the best farming land, but you can run cattle there. And that's kind of what I was brought up for the first six years of my life. I was actually born in Macclesfield in Cheshire, because that's where my mother had me when my dad was there, right? And then they moved into Yorkshire. And I always regretted, because I was born in Cheshire, that I could never play cricket for Yorkshire. Because <laughs> it was made obvious, evident to me later in my life that uh, in those days you had to be born in a, one of the counties to play cricket there. So uh, it's kind of it's just kind of a weird, amusing little thing. Anyway, so after the war, um, they decided to come either to South Africa or Canada. But because he it didn't like the regime, he decided that maybe the best place would be to somewhere where it could grow fruit. And if it could grow fruit, it had to be a warm climate. Mistake number one, he chose southern Ontario. <laughs> you know, down around Welland and Niagara Peninsula. It's okay in the summer, but the winters are not so great. So that's where they went first, and he, he got a job on the Welland newspaper there. And he ran a farm from an American landowner while we were there. We went there long, maybe six months. So I went to school there, my first year of school, and then uh, there was an advertisement in the, the papers for someone to run the Perth newspaper up here. It was going bankrupt. They need someone to, to do the whole, manage it, write for it, work the machines, everything. Small town weekly newspaper. So we got the job up here as managing editor of the paper here, right? So I was kind of brought up in a newspaper context. And as I got older, into my early, into my teens, um, I started when I was about 12 years old, 11 years old, sweeping the floors in the back room, setting type, you know, doing casting metal, that kind of stuff. But as I got older, I got to replace the reporter when he went on holidays in the summer. So we did kind of things like Farmer of the Week. We'd go out and interview a farmer and you know, did all that kind of thing. And eventually ended up winning the Ontario Best Weekly Newspaper Awards, which my dad never gave me credit for being part of, of course. I was just, you know, the kid in the back room, so. But one of the things I learned was how to observe, because as a journalist, you've got how, what, when, where, why. You know, how, what, when, where, who, right? Five rules of journalism. And so you're always asked, all these questions wherever you're doing a story, right? You've got to find out who it is and where they're from and what they're doing. And, and I think that kind of predisposed me to that kind of a, a career in some way. I worked for Canadian Press for a while while I was at university in Ottawa and uh, as part-time and things like that. And my brother Roger, <coughs> he was six years younger than me and uh, very smart guy, and he had uh, first degree at 16, second degree at 19, and his graduate degree at 21, so. And he taught university in Lagos in Nigeria, he taught university in, uh, in Ghana, and he was a bona fide journalist, and uh, uh, he was, um, again, like my dad, he was very pro. So he headed off after that, he headed off to, um, to Ireland to write a book about the Biafran War because he was in the middle of it. And uh, he got in a motorbike accident there and came back here and spent months with my parents recovering. Then went to Windsor to work on the Windsor Star. And he got caught in a fire in his apartment building and got killed at the age of 26. And uh, my dad never really recovered. And at that time, we were, I was in Australia writing my PhD. That was around 1970. And that's one of the reasons like we came back, right? So you look at that in your background, you think it's one of those things like certain specific events in your life changed the course. Could have stayed in Australia, but didn't. <clears throat> Come back here kind of uneasily and then kind of started to fit in. But I think my dad's attitude toward the other, toward the different, pe different peoples, uh, really made an impact on I me. Mean, you just grow up not thinking there's much of a difference between anybody. And the thing about Perth, 
it's pretty well all white. It's all basically Irish, Scottish, English background. There'd be a Chinese restaurant. There were some Jewish people. Nobody really knew who they were Jewish, right? Um, it, was a, it wasn't a discriminatory environment, but people didn't know about discrimination anyway. Like it was a funny kind of environment to grow up in. There weren't really any others around, but people were accommodating to each other, which kind of spilled over to anything different. So I, when I left U of T and retired, some of my colleagues at Trinity College said, uh, how can you possibly retire and go back to Perth? It's kind of right-wing conservative area of Ontario in the Ottawa Valley. And I said, you just don't understand it. You, know, you just don't understand it. People take care of each other here. It doesn't matter who you are. The politics on one level may be, you know, whatever. John Diefenbaker and maybe Stephen Harper. But at another level, people take care of each other. That's why you live in a place like this. And uh, the urban impersonal milieu is far worse, even though it might be liberal left in its political thinking, right? And I think that's kind of where I ended up. And when I got to Australia, the thing about the Aborigines, they were so different that it was intriguing, not something that I wanted to put aside. I wanted to find out why they were different, but I couldn't understand the accounts of them. So that's what I did. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, um, the whole thing about the, the film Arrival was this nonverbal language, which comes out as kind of um, uh, ink from a squid. It, they squirt it out of these tentacles, and it comes in a circle, and it's coded, right? And that's what Australian Aboriginal artists like. I was going to get to that. But Australian Aborigines have very complex languages. Anandilyago on Groot Island has noun, nine noun classes like Latin. It has prefixes, has noun incorporation. So your nouns are incorporated into your verbs, and you end up with words, sentence words this long, right? Very complex language, very difficult to learn the subtleties of it. You can learn the language, but they can lose you anytime they want to, unless you've been there for 25 years, right? <clears throat> the other language they have is visual. And it's represented by, I think, something like this. I think this is a pretty good example. Oh, sorry. This comes from the Western Desert, from a place called Yuen Demu, which is north of, northwest of Alice Springs. And you can kind of hold it up any which way. It doesn't really matter. There's really no way to, no right way to hang it or not hang it. And I was asking you before, what do you think it is? Well, snakes? I don't know. What do I think it is? Well, I didn't buy it because I knew what it was and what it meant. I bought it for its aesthetic satisfaction, if you like, or its aesthetic. It please, pleases me aesthetically. It's coded in a way that we can't understand. And according to the artist, it's a drawing or a painting of women sitting on the ground, harvesting plants to make combs for their hair. That's what this picture actually is. It, it's not ambiguous to her, but it is to us. And they get more complicated than this as you go into the more sacred aspects of the culture in the central desert. A lot of the symbols, a lot of the iconography in these paintings are known only to the elders and they're only reve revealed in sacred ceremonies. They're not revealed in, uh, in public. So <clears throat> in the mid 70s, an art a teacher named Garrett Barden at UN Demu decided to try and get the Aborigines to transfer their sand paintings. These would be done on the sand during a ceremony, then they'd be brushed away after. Transfer their sand paintings to um, canvas. And the elders met and eventually decided that what they would do was make the paintings themselves available, but keep the hidden meanings to themselves. And they've done that ever since. So you can go into a, an art gallery in Alice Springs or Darwin or Cairns, Sydney, and you can see these magnificent paintings. 
and they have a, an, a meaning attached to them uh, uh, and a paragraph or two. And it's a superficial meaning of what the painting means, but the hidden meaning is a way of communicating between groups in that particular region. So one painting done in one area can be transported in form to another area. And even if people speak a different language, they will know exactly what that means, what the Dreamtime story is in that meaning, uh, who's responsible for managing the ceremony. All the things that go with all the details connected with that are already communicated through a painting like that, or the ones on the wall there, very similar. I don't know the meanings of those, except that they're maps of countries, of territories around you and Demu and up in the Kimberley. So <clears throat> we can interpret them however we, however we like. It doesn't make any difference. They're not what we think they are, unless you're really initiated into the culture. You, you'll never know. In Groot Island, they have similar things, um, and they're revealed largely in the form of statues during ceremonies. And they represent the original ancestral spirits, and they have car they're carved, and they're, you're not told the meaning of each carving unless you're initiated into that clan, right? Or you're Jungwai, the boss of that clan, then you also get to know. So it's all interdependent. But to, to imagine having <clears throat> to communicate with no verbal language at all, which is what the film is about. Not pretty hard to imagine. We're so used to language. And language, though, is abstract. And it's once removed from the reality. So you wonder, I mean, I've got a case full of books and articles there. And you wonder if down 50 years from now, 100 years from now, what those words mean to me when I was writing them compared to what they mean to me now compared to what they mean to me a hundred years from now. I mean, totally different. You can read the same words, but they won't have the same meaning. and They won't be understood. And that's why I think Goulas told me way back that he didn't want kids on Groot Island to learn to read and write. He was more like, trust your visual memory, trust your third eye, whatever you want to call it, to communicate things. Don't trust things we write down. And, they lose their meaning over time. Each generation changes the meaning. Unless I'm around to say, no, that's what I meant. No, this is what he meant, somebody's going to say, right? So you never know how it's going to work out. So <clears throat> I thought the film was very good from that point of view, that it was introducing us to a whole new way of thinking. But that in the movie, the thinking is a portal to the future. And they give them the language in the end, and it's used to give them lessons about what's going to happen in the future kind of thing. So whether you can actually be in the present in the future as well as in the past, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But we don't take it seriously, I don't think. How many people actually understand what being in the moment your entire life is like? What part of your being does that trigger? What feeling do you have being in the moment as a concept that's every day, every minute of every day, that you're in the present, not in the past, not in the future, that there is no past and future. You're just in the moment, like here. The moment when we started out this morning is gone, but it's a moment. And if there's no time, we should be able to access that moment somehow. That's what the movie's about, access that moment, because it's only a moment and time's collapsed around it. Interesting. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm getting a, my cough is coming back. <laughs> so anyway, Pangerton. Yeah, Chris Trott was one of my PhD students, and he's now at the University of Manitoba. And um, he went up to Baffin Island to um, Arctic Bay for two years. And uh, he pretty well was studying pretty well social organization and how the culture fit together, basically. Focusing on um, um, namesake relationships, things like that. They learned the language. He learned the language so quickly that the museum in Ottawa sent someone up to check if he really 
was fluent in the language. This is true. And of course he was. And they came back. Wasted a lot of money traveling up there for nothing. Really dumb. Eh? So anyway, Chris spent his two years up there. <clears throat> and, and he's probably telling his own story, so I won't. But it, what happened is eventually when he came back and then ended up teaching, uh, Manitoba he invited myself and uh, Alexa, my second wife, to come up and stay with them during the summer with the student group. So we went up there in the summertime and uh, lived in Pangatung. And Liam was very young, he's maybe two, two years old. And he came with us and we had, a, had just an amazing time. People are just so friendly and generous. And, uh, and I kind of fell in love with the sculptor. The sculpting is, I thought the sculpting had that aesthetic quality that Aboriginal art had. It just kind of struck you, the form, the beauty of the forms that people produced. And I got interested in how come they did that, you know, how come they were able to achieve that. <clears throat> and it was similar to the Aborigines. It was kind of a vision of the spiritual within the material that led the really good artists to the way they sculpted. And one of those was Piona Kiojek, a young, at the time, he, I guess he was his mid thirties. And uh, people were talking about him in a kind of guarded tones, like he was to be avoided. And uh, Chris said not, Chris said he, he was defined or regarded as being a shaman. And so I finally got to meet the guy, and he's very shy, and I got to talk to him. <clears throat> and he recounted to me a lot of his experiences on the land and in the spiritual sense. And uh, uh, during the course of the summer, and the next summer I came up by myself again, then I came up a third time, sort of almost in the winter time, to see what it's like in the snow and stuff. So we formed a, a really nice relationship. and. He taught me how to sculpt. At least I watched him sculpt. It's like in Australia, nobody teaches you to play the didgeridoo. You have to sit there and watch and pick it up. And if you can't pick it up, you don't pick it up. And that's what they apply to themselves too. So carving was the same thing. You watch how they do it. So there's a kind of logic to it. You go, you go to select your stone from a quarry or from the store where they have a, a, a storehouse. They bring in stone from other places, some of them from around Pang, but Pang's fairly hard stone. So you get some softer stone from Dorset and places like that. So they look at some stone and then they see something in a stone that looks like they can tease it out. They don't just pick a piece of stone and then carve something on it. And so you watch this happening. You watch them, oh, this one and this one, this one, this one, then finally pick this one. But they're not really telling you what's going to be the end result. And then they take it home and they just start chiseling away. And pretty soon a form emerge, starts to emerge and it emerges more and more. And, uh, and then out it comes. And, uh, um, and you have to learn how to polish it. You have to learn how to sand. You have to have, learn how to refine it. Um, and you also have to gain a sense of aesthetics, which is a balance and proportion that in some ways you either can do it or you can't, or you have it or you don't. And it's a way of looking at something without, I don't know how to put it, you, you're almost meditating on it in order to know the final form of the, the stone that's going to come out. In other words, if it's a bear, it's not just a bear. It's a bear in a certain aesthetic setting or aesthetic construction where the proportions and the balance is perfect. That's what you're aiming for. So the bad art, and there's bad art in Australia, there's bad art, is ones that can't do that. They're just churning out a bear to send down south and south. But these, the ones, Manasi Maniapic did the, the one up on the top there. The, uh, the shaman with a polar bear riding on his back, flying. He's, I, I went up there 
uh, I think it was my third trip, and I met him and I asked him to do me a carving of a bear. And I figured, and then what, a week later he said, it's ready, and I went and got it, and that's what he did. So for him, a bear wasn't just a bear. It was a bear with a spiritual connection to something else, right? And that's what it was. And then I said, well, you know, I asked for something like this, and you wanted, I think it was $200, right? I said, sure, how much do you want for that? And he said, oh, it's just the same. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not a $200 carving. And he just wouldn't, he wouldn't take anything else. I said, no, that's okay. Just, you know, whatever. And he, he was another one. He wasn't a shaman. He wasn't a Christian. He was just kind of in the middle, but a superb carver. And uh, Jake Oishalatak was probably Chris's best friend. I've got some of his downstairs, and the same thing. Aesthetically, really, just wonderful pieces. And he died not too long ago either. And these were some of the senior carvers in the community. They're still there, but unfortunately, well, Piona's still there. But uh, so I wasn't really doing ethnography. I was just going to hang out and learn how to carve, and learn some stuff from Piona about his shamaning. I had no intentions really of publishing it or making much of it. Maybe write it up just for me. Like a biography kind of thing. That'd be all. And then the last day I was there on my third trip, in his house, he just handed me a shaman's sketchbook and said, "Here, take this." It's just amazing record of his visions. Well, I have no idea. Like, what am I supposed to do with it? And he's very shy and he's retiring. And people have asked me if they meet, if I could put them in touch with him and I refuse because I know what he's like and it would have to be you know really special and whether you could go up there or I could go back up and say you know we could publish this for you he probably wouldn't it probably would just go right to wouldn't mean that much it wouldn't mean anything actually because he's in the moment he's got these always in his mind these are with him all the time these are just for him just What's important is what he's got in here, right? The experiences he can have consistently experiencing these beings. This is no one-off thing. These are his compatriots up there. And I'm sure he doesn't care whether they're printed or not, right? And anybody reads them or not. He's a shaman, not an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I've just hung on to these things. And, uh, just sitting there. 